Hey guys, it's Matt here in the Eastwood Garage. We're doing another live tech session on Facebook, YouTube, and Eastwood.com. For any of you guys that haven't watched one of these before, we like them to be as interactive as possible. So I want you guys to log in, join the chat, ask questions, and interact. Uh, we have Randy over here as well, uh, man in the chat. Yeah, and if you need any help, Matt, I'm, I'm here for you today. Awesome. I may need a hand here and there. Um, so, yeah, Randy will be answering questions if you guys have any. Um, he'll be happy to answer them for you. And if there's any he thinks are good to throw on camera, uh, I'll answer any I can uh, live on camera. So today we're doing Wednesdays, I try and do a little bit of a project type um, deal where we show you a project or a how-to. Um, today we're going to tackle, this is probably going to end up being a multi-video um, process, but uh, today what we're going to do is tackle, this is a Tri-5 Fender 56 um, Fender, and it has the dreaded uh, upper eyebrow area is rotted out. Um, this one's brought it out pretty good at the top here. So one of the guys in the store, Bob, um, his son has has uh, this car and they're going to be tackling fixing some of the major rot in it and I thought I'd show the process a couple different ways to attack it and things that you often see come up um, when doing these repairs so I have a little montage first I have a piece here that's that's just roughed in um, we have a montage that we threw together that we could throw up on the uh, on the screen for you guys of I was making this piece here so you can see that I made a pattern a paper pattern and scribe, or marked everything out um, we transferred it to the metal and then uh, you know, cut, cut it out roughly to size. And then from there, uh, it actually just took a lot of form. So it's just uh, forming it around the shape of the fender there. And then on the inside area, there's uh, a bit of shape. So I was using the rubber band on the English wheel to start doing that reverse. And we were kind of putting a little bit of more shape in uh, there in the sandbag, using the planter hammer to knock out some of that real rough stuff. And then we're using the English wheel to try and pull out some of the, uh, the tucks that were in there. And then when we had the flange, I used the shrinker stretcher just to uh, pull some of that together. So there was uh, earlier on when we were uh, pulling some of that. And you can see in the English wheel there, it's starting to come in a little more. So it's flattening the flange out. Um, we're starting to get that curve coming into it. So this is the piece here. Um, at this point, you kind of need to stop and, and address uh, some stuff before you get too far in. So this part. Um, it fits on, I mean, again, this is roughed in a little bit, but I have a bunch of extra, you may notice here, on the front where it needs to fold over. Now, this fender uh, has a character line or a body line that runs down. I don't know if Joe will be able to catch the, catch the light line there on this, but right across the top of here, there's a real faint just kind of peak in the fender. It runs pretty much from the back of the fender all the way to almost up front. Uh, to the front of the fender and even with this rotted away I could feel it it's all the way up here right against that rot. Um, if you were making this piece like what I was showing from scratch um, if you went to fold this front edge over it's for the for the eyebrow what happens is you won't be able to you'll be locking this shape in and you won't be able to uh, get this in a bead roller or anything else to actually put that line in it. So what I'm going to show you is two, two different ways but I'm going to show you on this one first we're going to go over the bead roller here and um, what I have in here is uh, our forming dies on the bead roller and <clears throat> as Joe's going to get set up there, he'll get a close up of what we got going on. But we got the, a sharper die here set up uh, with the soft lower wheel here. And what this does, this kind of lets us, uh, it, it digs in a little bit, but it's not, um, it allows you to kind of create a softer shape in the piece. So with this, I tested this to the inside of the, uh, of the fender just to see um, that this shape here kind of matched the peak that we have going on. So what I could do, because we don't have this locked in yet, I can actually flatten this piece out here. It's not going to hurt anything. So I can just put on my leg here. I'm going to take a lot of that form where it wraps around the side of the fender out. And that's 20 gauge? Uh, this is 18 gauge here. Yeah, so this is 18 gauge steel. That's a good, good point. I always forget to say that when we have a lot of questions about it. So what I'm trying to do here is just make sure that it'll run through our bead roller. Uh, shortly, yeah. Yeah, Randy's going to help me roll, a, roll the bead in. So yeah, if you want to, I'll just have to at the beginning there help it a little bit. So I got it upside down because we want our, um, you know, we want the peak to be 
be up. Oh, just got to warm up. Yeah, you're only as good as your cranker, man. <laughs> That's true. That's what I've been told. So I have just, just a little bit. I basically am just putting hand pressure on this because this is a real light character line, so you don't want to go too crazy. We can always run it through a couple times. All right. So, yeah. all right, go ahead, and then I'm going to have to, probably when it hits, yeah, I'm going to have to go ahead. And good, faster. Yeah, it's good as long as it's fitting through there. there so go. what we're doing is he's just going nice and slow, and I'm just eyeballing this. You can, if, if you've got a piece that's got a nice straight, cut edge on the one side, you can put the uh, bead roller guide that we sell and you can run it in. Since this one has some, not a straight line, I'm just doing it by eye and I do my little pirate squint that seems to work for me. Um, all right, perfect. So, it's going to be hard to see if Joe can get this, but you can see it put just a real subtle little peak down that center line there. Now, if we want to go a little deeper with that, we can put, we can put it through again, tighten it a little more, but that establishes that line there. So, that's one way that you can do that, but that's one thing to keep in mind before you start bending any edges over if you're making a panel from a flat piece, you need to make sure you do that at this point. Then from here, we could start folding this edge over once we're happy with that, that shape in it. Can you get that? Is that showing up on there? It's faded, but... Yeah, it's hard to see. Maybe you aim the flat up at it. No, the, like, so he's looking down it? I don't know. Maybe that doesn't do it either. No. Ooh, right there. Yeah, there you can see it. So you can see that line. It's just barely raised, but that's all it is if you look on the fender of the car. It's got a real faint line in it. That's something that a lot of times you see is forgotten on, on these Tri-5s when people do these eyebrow patches. Um, they don't put that little line in there and then the line is different from one fender to the other um, or it fades out really early. So that's one way to do it. If you're making the panel, that's one thing you need to do. The other thing we're going to do here is uh, Bob with, this, with the car that they have, they got this little, um, I've, I've already cut this down to save us a little bit of time, but um, he had a little cheap patch that he bought, and what we found is when you started fitting it to the car, or to the fender, the, the reverse was, was, did not fit at all. It was probably an inch or inches up off of, the, off of the metal, and didn't fit and was going to require a lot of extra work. So I cut off all this extra junk here that wasn't really needed, because the fender was solid, and um, got rid of all of that. So this is kind of what I'm left with. <clears throat> And then on this fender here, you can see um, I've scribed the line, and we'll get that when we get a little further, but I've scribed the line in here where we're going to actually cut it off. But you can see this piece fits in now half decent. And the one thing I've done is you don't want to cut in the center of this reverse curve here, this cur how it curves in there. You do not want to cut right down the center of that and try and weld in that. What's going to happen is it's going to warp and get all crazy on you and it'll be very difficult to smooth out that area. So what you should try and do is get up in the flat as much as you can where it's, it's not having a compound curve going on. So I cut up into here where it's mostly flat again, just above it, and I can weld in there and I won't have as much of an issue. So that's that. Now the other problem with pretty much every one of these patches I've ever seen, and I actually did a little little googling online or make sure that my uh, my memory was correct. I don't think any of the patches that you buy these eyebrows, they have this character line put into them. So this one, I've already, I've already kind of marked off an area where we're going to do it, but this one's completely flat. So if we go to weld this piece in, and again, remember this was much longer, it was out to here. So we would have been back real far on the fender and we would have had no character line. So what people end up doing is they end up just putting body filler and, and, and sculpting it in, if you will, um, or they fade the body line back and, and that doesn't always look great. So if you're trying to put this, this line back in and you have this panel, it's already got that curved edge in it here. So it's rolled over. So the problem is I can't, I can't open this up like we did before in the bead roller because it's got all this strength from this rolled edge here. So you can't get this in the bead roller to put that line in. How else can you get that in? What can you do? 
So I'm going to go over to the sandbag here and show you a little trick that you can do. Um, and let's see if I'll turn this a little bit so Joe can get it. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to actually put the metal there that we need for that character line. So we're going to actually raise up this area into the um, in the area that I just have open here. We're going to raise that area up. So <clears throat> this is kind of like if you guys are familiar with tin smithing, um, jewelry making, things like that. They they do some of this stuff where you put kind of put the metal where you want for a little detail. It's the same thing with this. Um, so I have one of our Fairmont body hammers with a, with a pick end on it. And you can use the short one, you can use the long one. Um, you want to be careful that your pick end isn't too sharp because um, if it's really, really sharp, you can actually just punch a hole right in the panel. So it's still a little bit of a blunt end, but it's, it's still got a pick end on it. So what we're going to do is I have an area just right in here that's, that doesn't have tape on it that we're going to hammer in the sandbag because what that's going to do is it's going to have some give just like we did in the bead roller with the soft wheel. It's going to give a little bit and allow us to uh, the material to move downward. So I'm going to Here. Let's see, get this so you guys can see what's going on. Now, why use a pick over a chisel? Uh, so, Joe had a good question. Joe, the camera guy, had a good question. Why use a pick over a chisel? Um, by using the, the uh, pick end, it actually allows me to be a little more, I could go sideways like this, but I actually want it to raise. I want it to actually be stretching the material or raising it. So by hitting it with a long flat area like that, it's harder to stretch the material with this long flat area versus using a real small defined pick area. So what we're doing is we're trying to hit really close together and you can see already, uh, I probably got a straight, give me one second. Got one in my box. Sorry, got a straight edge here. So you can see I put a I put a crown or a peak in that piece right there, just by doing that little bit of hammering there. So it 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 kind of fades off here. So I only I only hit it once or twice in here to try and get it to kind of fade off at the end, but it's got a lot more severe of a crown now in this peak. I don't know if I, if I turn it like that, is that a little better? Or actually, yeah. And again, it's really subtle. It's tough to get on camera, but it's subtle on the car. But all I did was just hit really close together and you can go back with your hammer and, and continue to hit in those areas if you want to get it closer. Um, and then uh, probably a question we'll, we'll get is, you know, what do you do about all the little marks that are in between, um, in between there? What you can do is take a dolly that matches that area there. It's got a kind of sharp uh, edge on it. And you can use a slapper or lightly with a hammer. You can hammer on it and it'll blend it all out and smooth it. But um, it's a fairly smooth surface as it is already. But, you know, if you want to blend in those little bits of spots we might have missed. So we can go back to our fender here. And we'll fit this in. And I already started cutting the ends here just so you guys weren't watching me cut to forever and ever. But, um, and I got a piece of tape here and the center of that tape is the center of our character line. It fits in like that. And we got a little, little bit of a crown or, or a peak right there on the piece. So again, we can hammer that a little more. But I'll probably leave that where it's at, and then once we're finishing the weld, um, I will actually go back in and we could slap that area just to get it, um, get it defined and smoothed out. But right now I just wanted to stretch the material up to get that metal where we wanted it there while it's easy to get to it, and then we can finish it uh, when we're doing our final work here. So <clears throat> fitting the panel up and, and, and getting it cut out and everything, that's a question we get a lot, um, is do I butt weld? 
Do you use the, the, the inner grip clamps that go in between? Um, how do I, you know, what's best? And the answer I always guess, give is whatever is the best for your skill level or your technique um, that's best is really what the answer is. So if, if you have never really TIG welded before, um, just jumping right in and trying to butt weld a panel and TIG weld it, you're going to probably have a lot more problems. So you got to work with what you have. Um, I prefer to butt weld with the TIG welder if at all possible. So I don't know if Joe, you can get in here. What I'll do is I'll, I'll put this piece on here. I should have done our trick we showed yesterday, Mark's trick of uh, using the, but what we have here is I've scribed, and I know it's tough, you can probably catch it right in there. So I've scribed the line comes up and around that's right on this. So I've used it. <clears throat> we have a sheet metal layout kit and I have our scribe. So I've used the scribe to scribe a really sharp point on that. And yeah, there you go. You can see that pretty good there. So that gives us an exact um, you know, line to cut on. But what you do not want to do is just straight away try cutting on that line with, with the snips, or I'm sorry, with the uh, with a cutoff grinder or our throatless, electric throatless shears. Um, you, you don't want to really just go cutting on that. What you want to do is cut a little bit off of the line so we're not trying to cut that all in one shot and then we can do it carefully. Um, so I'm going to use, this one's kind of a fun one to use, I don't use it much, but uh, this is our little pneumatic nibbler. So the cool thing about this guy is it shoots out these little half moon uh, slivers, but what it allows you to do is you can turn this pretty much in any direction and do really, really tight turns with it. A regular shape things like, like this fender here, we can cut through it, whereas using some of the other shears may not have been as good. So turn that on. I've started, I'll try not to put my back to you guys, so I'll start over here. And when we come around top, we'll show you a little, make a little noise now. Loud. <laughs> Go back a little bit. But yeah, the cool thing is you can really just turn this piece and follow that shape there. And Joe can probably get in here and show on the top here. You can see my scribe line and then the area that I left there. So I just leave a little sliver quickly uh, or leave a little sliver that you can cut off and then use your aviation snips to go around and cut the final, do the final trim here. There's these guys. And I'm going to cut right on my line now. When we come over the top, I'll show you guys, try and get a close up of, you want to put your, the tip of your snips right on that line. So we're getting a nice accurate cut. You can see the pieces rolling off as you cut. Are those left cut snips? Uh, yeah, I guess these would be left cut snips. I always have to look because I know. Uh, you can, they can cut either if you cut, turn them upside down, but yes, these are the left hand, the, the left cut snips, but you can cut however if you turn them upside down. We can cut it the other way if we'd like, but uh, the big thing to remember is that we want the, the, what we do not want our trash is going off to the left there. Um, I don't want to be flipping these over or using the right side because they would actually damage this piece over here. 
be fighting it all the time. So the way the it's easy to remember, Matt. The way I remember it is green is right cut. And on a green light, you can often make a right turn on green. Ah. So I just right hold them cut up. green. So that means red has to be left. Ah. Just, you know. Right. That's a good little tip. I usually just grab them and go, this doesn't fit. Yeah, this doesn't fit right. Crap, I could need the other ones. <laughs> then if the, none of them fit, then I'm really in trouble. Yeah. All right, so as I come around, we'll uh, try and get a shot right on the line here. Cutting right there, right on the line. Coming around this corner here, I gotta take little bites to make sure that we're staying right on that line there. So you can see on that corner, I left a little bit extra material because I didn't want to run into it with my. I gotta get rid of this. I just got this this little bit here. So now we got it cut real nice. What I like to do, we sell these uh, slapping files, which are nice for showing up lows and or uh, showing up highs and lows in a panel in your metal finishing. But they also work really nicely as files. Filing it off so there's no real sharp edges. Catch your hands. Especially around this corner here where we're cutting. So now we can test it. See where we're at here. Fit that up. Now like I said, this panel, you can even see here, doesn't have quite the right shape, but at least now that we're out of that reverse, we can manipulate this a little bit and just get it to fit how we want it to. Um, but still need to probably trim a little more off here to get it. But this is sometimes stuff that, this is where it's time consuming that you need to get it to fit as good as possible. So uh, for instance, Right here, this panel flattens out this patch panel right in here. So right there, we're going to have to address that to get that up a little further. So that's cut and fit. Um, and we can actually manipulate that a little bit. Get that to fit right there see where that peak is and get that to line up and that peak that's there kind of flows right into the peak that we have going here already, which is nice. So do we have any questions at all before I, uh, we're going to probably doctor this up for the next time. Yeah, we had one uh, quick sure. question, which you kind of covered yesterday was, uh, why were you using the snips there and not a power tool? Okay. Yeah. So um, the, the, the best answer is uh, there's less room for error. So by cutting with a power tool, because we are doing a butt weld, uh, we want our cuts to be as accurate as possible. So I've already cut this piece to what I like. So I want the fender cut to match as close as we can to what I cut before. So I want my cut to be as accurate as possible. I don't care what tool you're using, whether it's um, a set of our electric shears, whether it's a cutoff grinder. It's very, very difficult, especially on something that has shape and curves like this to get an accurate cut that's dead on by using a power tool. So um, it's something that took me a while to, um, to slow down a little bit and do that extra step, but man, it makes the panels fit so much better. Where usually 
Um, all you have to do is just maybe do a tiny little file or shaving on something and it'll fit perfect. So it's really just accuracy. Um, and you want to leave just a, the, a little sliver uh, because the more you leave, I got a piece that's sitting here. The more, the wider this little, this little curly cue is that's coming off, as you're cutting with these snips, um, you're curling that up. So the thicker that is, the harder it's going to be. You have to curl more material. So you're just saving yourself some time or some work by doing that. But it's just accuracy. If you're trying to butt weld a panel, you want it to fit as good as possible. If you're doing it with the TIG especially, you want it to fit with like zero gaps. You want pretty much no gaps at all. And you could spend hours just fitting a panel together to do that. So now that we're pretty much fit up, what, I, what I'll do um, for next time I'm going to file this all down, get this sanded, get everything prepped, and then we're going to show you guys actually TIG welding this panel, this patch panel in, and then um, I'm going to TIG weld everything together, and then we'll show you the process of using the bullseye picks and the hammer and dolly to uh, reverse the shrinkage that happens when you weld uh, and kind of finish it out uh, pretty good with using those, give you some tips and tricks. So is that all we got for, for questions today? That's all the questions for today. Cool. So when are we, we're going to continue this though, right? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, uh, again, I was probably not as clear as I should be, but yes, what we're going to do next time is we're going to actually weld this piece on that I've cut. So I'm going to probably have another hour's worth of work of just sanding and prepping and filing this to get everything really, really good. And then uh, we're going to weld this on. So I'll get this tack welded on and then we'll let you guys see the whole welding process of TIG welding. And we're putting together the whole completed video you'll be able to watch too, right? Yes, yes. So after we're done, uh, we're going to put together the whole video, as Randy said. And then you, you guys that are just watching this, or you may miss the other one, check our YouTube channel. And uh, we'll have these on the YouTube channel. You can watch the full-length video from start to finish. We'll show the process. So, uh, But that's just the first step to getting this cut and a couple little tricks. So thanks, guys, for watching. If you have any ideas for future videos or anything you'd like to see, hit us up. Uh, again, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at 3 o'clock, we're doing live broadcasts uh, here in Eastwood Studios. So uh, make sure you, you check us out then. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll catch you later.